What's up, 621? How you guys feeling tonight? You guys feeling good? Awesome. Well, hey, my name is Justin. I'm a part of the team here at Life Church, and, and I just want to say welcome. Uh, super glad you guys chose to hang out with us on a Wednesday night. It, it's cold out there. It's rainy out there, and you braved the, the harsh conditions because this is nothing to y'all because y'all are from Michigan, right? It's like, psst, this is like, this is like everyday fall right here. Uh, so uh, thank you for hanging out with us tonight. I want to give a special shout out to uh, those that are here for the very first time. Uh, thank you so much for, for braving it. I, I know it's hard to, to go to a place for the very first time. You're like, are the people going to have three heads? Are they going to speak a weird Christian language? Uh, should I bought a Honda, but I bought a Kia? I, I don't know. Uh, but you came out here tonight, and uh, I just want to say welcome. Uh, let me encourage you. Uh, stop by the table out there on your way out because we have a gift that we want to give you guys just for hanging out with us tonight. Uh, tonight we're in our first week in a series that we're calling Build. Everybody say Build. build. You guys could do better than that. Everybody say Build. For the next month, we're going to be looking at a character in the Bible named Nehemiah. We're going to be focusing a lot of our time and attention on the feat that Nehemiah accomplished, which was rebuilding the wall of Jerusalem. Uh, we're, going to, we're going to learn a lot about, uh, about Nehemiah. We're going to learn a lot through his story and the observation of his life. We're going to learn a lot about compassion, leadership, and service. You see, uh, we believe that this series is going to be the series that takes you from this level to the next level. Ooh. Because that's what Nehemiah's life challenges us to do. It challenges us to have this greater picture of life. It inspires us to go after something more, something bigger. And so I want to speak from this idea today uh, it's this idea of this, home, sweet, home. <sighs> Make some noise if any of you guys were born and raised in Michigan. <laughs> all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. Make some noise if we got any Michigan State fans in the house. <laughs> you know... When I went to Walmart and got my Wolverine shirt, I guess you could call me a Walmart Wolverine. I thought I was picking the right team. <laughs> Clearly, I need to get myself some Penn State joggers. You know what I'm saying? No, nah, I'm just kidding. I'm joking. I'm joking. Go blue. I'm not turning back. Go blue. So you guys might not know this about me, but I was born and raised in the greater Washington, D.C. area. I grew up seeing all the monuments. Like, that was right there in my backyard. And so home sweet home for me is this place called Gaithersburg, Maryland. Now, you may not know this, but Gaithersburg is number one on the top ten list of most diverse cities in America. Uh, so I'm a Maryland boy, two and through. Now behind me, I've got the Maryland flag, because let's be real, Maryland's got the freshest flag out there. I will put that center stage. That flag is so fresh, you'd have thought you got it from Subway. Ah, uh, bars. Look how fresh that flag is, bro. Do you even know what your flag is? It's like the, what is it, the Ford logo? Michigan flag just has a big Ford logo on it. It's actually got, your flag actually, I, I researched it, it's got like a guy fishing with like a gun in his hand. So in one hand's like a fishing pool, in the other hand it's like a, a gun. It's, your flag's kind of weird. But we've got the greatest flag, Maryland does. Not only does Maryland have the freshest flag, but we've got the greatest Major League Baseball franchise in all of history in the Baltimore Orioles. I mean, come on. We got Cal Ripken Jr., Ken Griffey Jr., 
Must I continue because then Baltimore Orioles are fresh? All right, I need a volunteer real quick. Right there. Come on. Sydney, let's go. All right. Oh, y'all don't even know. Y'all, y'all don't even know. Okay, here's your, here's your thing. You're going you're gonna to throw these out. Y'all don't get to hear this. All right, so y'all got better made chips. And they okay. They're all right. But from where I'm from, you can only get these bad boys in three states, y'all. They're Utz potato chips. Now, my favorite just so happens to be these salt and vinegar chips because when you eat them, that's an experience. Y'all want some? Yeah. I mean, I can't hear y'all. Y'all want some? Oh, snap. Oh, snap. Oh, snap, it's madness out here. Woo. 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 Yeah. Yeah. They're animals. Savages. I'm going to save this one for later. Y'all can't have them all. Did you get one? Do you want one? Uh, Give it up for Sydney, y'all. Thanks, girl. I had to save two bags for myself. Them joints is fresh. Trust me, those are the best chips of all time. There's a whole bunch of famous people that are from Maryland. Let me list them off for you real quick because I'm just on a roll right now. My boy Kevin Durant plays for the Golden State Warriors. He's from Maryland. Babe Ruth is from Maryland. We got any, we got any book nerds out there? You love books? Anybody love books? Make some noise for books. Legendary author Edgar Allan Poe is from Maryland. And, and here we go. Now, I own this one. The greatest, the greatest, I said the greatest head coach of all time, Bill Belichick, is from Maryland. Now, tell me you don't see the resemblance between Bill Belichick and Darth Sidious, though. Like, they look so much alike. Here's why that's significant, because not only is he the greatest head coach of all time, he coaches the greatest quarterback of all time, who just so happens to have played for the University of Michigan, Tom Brady. Whew. Boy, got, he got five Super Bowl rings. Nah, but for real though, for real though, for real though, I'm going to tell you what I really love about Maryland, and then I'm actually going to preach today. Here's what I love about Maryland, and it's that part of Maryland that I take with me everywhere we go. Maryland is super diverse because in western Maryland, you've got mountains. Got some hillbillies out there. I got some family that live out there. In central Maryland, you've got cornfields and big tractors. Southern Maryland is one of the most diverse pockets in the United States. And then eastern Maryland has the beaches. All the fishermen. No matter where I end up, Maryland will always be home sweet home to me. I know. But what about you? Because one day someone's going to ask you where you grew up. They're going to ask you about where you're from. They're going to ask about your school. And maybe you love your town. Maybe you're like, it's the Disney World of all Towns, it's the greatest place on earth. And you can't imagine ever living anywhere else. Maybe you love your town, but maybe you hate your town. And you're the only person that feels that way. 
I mean, you can picture your friends getting married, growing old, having like 15 kids each. What? No. Hold up. Time out. All without moving two miles away from their parents or their step parents. And listen, there's nothing wrong with that. But you just know that when the time comes, you're going to be like, peace. I'm outro. I'm outro. I bet for many of you, you view your time here before you graduate as temporary. I'm just here. What really matters is what happens next when you leave this place. Most of you, Sea Town is nothing more than a launching pad for the life that you want to have later, you know, in the real world. But let me ask you a question. Does where you live right now matter? Does it have any significance beyond how good your high school football team is? Does it have any significance beyond your math class, your science class? Does it really matter? And so the guy we're going to look at in this series and the incredible story that he's the main character in could forever change the way you view your town, the people around you, and your role in it. We're going to look at one of the greatest building projects of all time. And it has the potential to alter your future if you lean in. His name is Nehemiah. And the story we're going to tell you about him is only scratching the surface. You see, Nehemiah has this great book with his name on it. But we're only going to be looking at the first few chapters. But before we get started, there's some things you need to know about Nehemiah. First thing is that he was Jewish. That's important because he doesn't live in the land that his people are from. That's the land that we call today Israel. And even though he'd never been to the place that his family was from, he felt a strong sense of connection and pull towards his homeland. See, to him, Jerusalem wasn't just the place where his family originated. It was a part of his identity. It was where he was from. Just so you have an idea of what Nehemiah was facing, let me give you some history. See, Israel had once been this powerful nation. But they made a series of bad decisions and they ended up getting conquered. The main city, Jerusalem, was destroyed. And the people who lived there, they were taken captive as slaves. So it gets real messy, like real quick. So originally they were, they were being held in Babylon, right? And then Babylon got conquered by Persia. Right, so conquered by Babylon, then conquered by Persia, and now they're slaves to Persia. I know it's, it's confusing, but it shows you the situation that the Israelites were in. So, so as the whole story begins, we've got Nehemiah. And Nehemiah is a slave to the Persian king. Uh, who remembers the movie 300? Anybody ever see that movie where he kicks the guy into the pit? <laughs> this is Sparta. So the king of Persia was Artaxerxes, which is actually the son of the king that's in that, that movie. So th that's crazy. Uh, but check it out. Nehemiah doesn't live in the land of his people, and he doesn't even live in the land of the people that conquered his people. And some of you, you might feel like, you might feel like that. You might feel like that where you are, you're only there by accident. I Man, I'm where I am by accident. Uh, maybe you live in the same town that you were born in, but you don't feel like you really fit in. Or maybe you were born somewhere else, somewhere that you loved. But then your parents got divorced, and, and now you're somewhere you don't really want to be. See, that's the position Nehemiah was in. He was living in a place that didn't feel like home. His family had this history in Jerusalem, and, and so he felt a tie to it because of his ethnicity and culture. He, he felt like Jerusalem, that, that's where his roots were. That's where he was from. So living in Babylon, Nehemiah has his job. Let me tell you about the job. Nehemiah was a cupbearer. He was a cupbearer to the Persian king. Uh, let me tell you what that means. Basically what would happen is uh, Nehemiah would take wine to the king, but before giving it to the king, he would have to taste test it. 
Now, Nehemiah would drink the wine before the king would drink it to make sure that there wasn't poison in the wine. So that was Nehemiah's job. And by this time in history, it had been years since Nehemiah's people had been held captive. And so some of them, they, they'd begun to make their way back to their hometown. And uh, one day Nehemiah is doing his job. His brother rolls up. And he begins to bring him bad news from Jerusalem. Uh, Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 3. When you see the word in yellow, I want you guys uh, to read it out loud as loudly as you can. This is the bad news that the brother brings Nehemiah. He says this. They said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is not bad. We could, we could do it better. Let's try it again. The wall of Jerusalem is down and its gates have been with fire. In other words, it's a total mess. The city wall is destroyed, which makes the city unsafe and vulnerable. See, a city without walls was a city unprotected. And that meant that everybody that lived inside of that city was defenseless. Anybody could come in the middle of the night. Even worse, everything had been burned. And it may have been a great city once upon a time, but it wasn't anymore. It was just a trash heap. The modern day equivalent would be a city that's been destroyed by a hurricane but has received absolutely no relief. Over the past month and a half, we, we've had uh, three areas in the United States just be rocked by hurricanes. Uh, Houston, South Florida, uh, and even now Puerto Rico. My wife is from Puerto Rico. She's got family in Puerto Rico, and they're going through it right now. Listen to how Nehemiah responds. When I heard these things, get ready, I sat down in. For some days I and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Nehemiah was heartbroken. Hearing about the problems of the land of his family, heart-wrenching. And even though he was living in Babylon, no matter where he went, he couldn't escape the connection that he felt to his homeland. I mean, surely he felt helpless, right? I mean, what could he do about it? His family, they were in Jerusalem, and he was far away. He was in Babylon, and he had no power. He was working a job where people stood around waiting to see if he dropped dead after tasting the king's dinner. I guess you could say he was in a dead-end job. That was really bad. Some people just got it. Some people just got it again. But in the next few verses, the Bible tells us how Nehemiah responds. Nehemiah gets this bad news, and he responds with prayer. Now, I know you're thinking, prayer? You know, maybe prayer isn't something that you would think of doing for your town or for your school, but that's exactly how Nehemiah started. Listen to how Nehemiah ends this prayer. Check it out. Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer, bless you, of this your servant, and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor, get ready, in the presence of this man. When Nehemiah says this man, he's talking about the king. You see, while it may have felt like Nehemiah's job and life were random, he was perfectly positioned to have a conversation with the king. In fact, he was one of very few slaves that actually had that opportunity. And to think that opportunity came at the risk of his life. Crazy. I can picture Nehemiah. You know, he had just tasted the king's food. And they're, like, sitting around waiting for Nehemiah to go through, like, deadly convulsions and stuff. Like, am I going to die? Like, 
Is it going to happen? And so they're sitting there waiting to find out if he's going to die or not. And he kind of hits the king with this awkward, like, hey, king. While we're waiting on my uh, untimely death, uh, I have a request. Can I, um, can I, uh, can I go back to Jerusalem? That was a gutsy move. You want to know why? Because it, if it angered the king, he could kill him right there. But the king wasn't angered by it. In fact, he was moved by it. The king heard him and he listened to him. Let me ask you a question. What would you do differently if you believe that God placed you in your town or school for a reason? What if you really believed it was a part of God's plan for you to be exactly where you are right now in your town? in your family, on your sports team at school, in your math class? Would you see those places differently if you weren't there by accident? And even if you were only there temporarily, would it be different if you knew that your place is a part of his plan? Because it's true. Your place is a part of his plan. You see, that was what made Nehemiah a history maker. There wasn't anything glamorous about being stuck in Babylon or being the test dummy for the king's food. But Nehemiah knew that God had placed him where he was for a reason. And as he prayed for his town, it came to him. He knew what they do. And he used his position with the king as an opportunity to take the first steps toward the greatest building project ever. So one day you'll move on from your school. You might even move on from this town. But while you're still here, you have options. You could simply pass the days just, just getting by, waiting for it to be over. But is that really how you want it to be? Do you really just want to spend your time just existing? Wouldn't it be incredible? One day you could look back and realize that you really did something that mattered. I didn't just work my way through school. I didn't just go with the flow. What if you did something that really, honestly, genuinely mattered? If so, then following what Nehemiah did would be a great place to start. And, and even if you don't care about church or, or God and, and you're not even into this thing, there's still a whole lot we can learn from this story. And, and maybe we could even walk away tonight liking our town, our city a little bit more. Everybody hold up a one and say one. one. Y'all can do better than that. Everybody say one. one. That's good. First thing I need you guys to do is care about your town. Believe it or not, caring is a choice. And you may not give two cents about your school, your town, or the people around it, but you have the ability to change that. You can decide to care. Think about it. What do you love about your school? What do you love about your town? What's not so great? The snow. If you knew God had you there for a purpose, what do you think he would want you to do? What or who do you think he would want you to pay attention to? Remember, your place is a part of his plan. Everybody hold up a two and say two. Four. Second thing you got to do is you got to pray for your town. Now, maybe this sounds crazy, but why not give it a try? Just for this week, let me challenge you this. Pray for your town. Pray for your school. Just this week. Just do it. Because when you pray, you might be surprised by how your feelings toward your town, toward your school change. And even if it feels accidental, know that you're not at your school, you're not in your town by accident. There is a purpose for you right where you are. Pray about what that purpose is. 
Because your place is a part of his plan. You better hold up a three and say three. three. The third thing you got to do is pay attention to who is around you. Look around. See, God placed you where you are for a purpose. And most likely that reason will include the people that are around you. Never overlook the importance of those people. Because God will take you from here to there. God took me from Florida to Baltimore to Michigan. And he has surrounded me by incredible people. People that I could not get through this season of my life without. You have no idea how your life might intersect with somebody that you don't even know. And placing you near those people may just be a part of God's plan. Earlier last week, I, I put a post on Facebook. I asked a question. And I want to end with this. But that question was, what do you think of when I say the word mission trip? I got a whole lot of answers, and most of the answers involved international mission trips. Here's the thing. I know people that are called to missions. They're overseas right now, and they're working their tail off in places where the gospel is not even legal. I applaud those that have bravely answered the call to go overseas. But the truth is that not all of us are called to do that. Now, some of us may be called to experience a mission trip. When I was 18, I'll never forget. I got this opportunity to go to Kenya. In Kenya, we built a, a church in the slums of Kibera. It's the largest slums in the entire world. I still go back and look at the photo of, of me handing out Fruit Loops to all of these kids, and they're all surrounding me, and they're calling me Wazungu, which means Obama's white people. That's what they called us. They thought we were Obama's white people. It's funny. I still remember the name of the, of the child that I met in the hospital. I remember the tears that I cried for him. I love missions. In fact, we're sending a mission team. Uh, to an orphanage in Haiti uh, called Ebenezer Glen. Come on, I'm so excited that I get to be a part of a church that has a global impact. Are you excited that you get to be a part of a church that does that? <laughs> when I got back from Africa, I was heartbroken. Thinking about it now, I am. And then I was talking to one of my mentors and he convicted me, which means that you feel it's not this guilt because guilt causes you to be frozen. It was conviction, which, which causes you to move. It causes you to act. He said, Justin, we live in Broward County. It's 93% unchurched. That means 93% of the people that live in Broward County have never been to a wedding. Uh, uh, if you got to go to a wedding, a funeral, and go to church on Christmas and Easter, and you're considered church. And he said 93% of the people that live here have not even done that. He said, don't fly over one mission field to get to another. I get it. When we think missions, we think, and I'm going to tie it in in a minute. You're going to get it. But when we think missions, we think overseas. It's so easy to fall in love with that. You want to know why? Because we don't live there. It's hard to love where you live, especially when you're sitting in that traffic on I-96 that traffic down on Ford Road, why are there so many people taking a left? I don't understand. But what would happen? What would happen if we fell in love with Canton? What would happen if we fell in love with Plymouth? What would happen if we fell in love with Metro Detroit? What would happen if Michigan became our mission? And instead of living our life to go on the next mission trip, to go on this next thing, what if we all just made the decision tonight to live our life on mission, to embrace our place and realize that our place is directly connected to our purpose. Our place is directly connected to his plan. 
as I shut this thing down tonight, I want to challenge all of you. Make Michigan your mission. There are thousands of students out there right now that don't know what it's like to have the freedom that comes with Jesus. And I believe and we believe that God wants to use all of you to introduce them to that. I love you guys. Pray for your conversations tonight. Think about why God has given you a specific amount of time here and not somewhere else. Let me pray for you guys. God, I hope that my words were not misinterpreted. I love missions. I love that I get to be a part of a church that participates in missions. But what I would love and what would make my heart just swell is if every student under the sound of my voice tonight would leave here making the decision to make Michigan their mission that they would live their lives on mission, that every student would realize that their place is a part of your plan, that they would start right here. Father, we love you. Thank you for Jesus. I want to invite you guys to stand as we worship tonight.